Welcome to a show about things you can see Without going far and a lot of them are free If you thought there was nothing in the old hard land You ought to hit the black op with these fools in a van Look out, they're driving hard Checking out art in their own backyard Randy does the steering so he won't hurl Mike's got the map, such a man of the world That's done with the camera, kinda heavy on his shoulder And that giant ball of tape, it's a world record holder Look out, they're driving hard Checking out art in their own backyard Look out, they're driving hard Checking out the world in their own backyard Checking out the world in their own backyard Dear TV Mailbag, where's a cop when you need one? Hi, Don the Camera Guy here, watching as those two producers with whom I travel strain in vain on Zanesville's main claim to fame, where you can actually tell someone, go to the middle of the bridge and turn left. Some people see bridges and ask why. I see bridges and ask why not. At any rate, this new day finds us taking lefts and rights on the back roads of America, as always in search of the odd and amazing, with the world's largest ball of videotape in tow. And as always, when it comes to where or why we're going, I'm the last to know. Though I think this could be Cambridge, hometown of Hopalong Cassidy, or at least the actor who portrayed him. Hey, the Cambridge Glass Museum. Passing it right by. Yeah, yeah, not gonna go there. Oh, come on. We're not gonna go to the Paperweight Museum either. That's here too. That's here, and we're not the Paperweight Museum. We're not gonna see that. If we're not gonna do the Paperweight Museum, and we're not gonna do the Glass Museum, we just blew right past that. We did. Hop along Cassidy. What? And hop along Cassidy. We're right here, and I'm sure there's a museum that we're not stopping. All right, it's back there. Well then, what are we gonna do? We're going to Dover. Dover. Look it up in the book there. It's Dover. the Warther Carvings Museum. Dover. Oh, oh look at that. Uh, oh. Yeah. I see why that gets your attention. Look at that guy. So you see, that's how decisions are made. Dover is our destination. More precisely, this charming piece of ground. But that doesn't mean we won't get distracted along the way. Mind if we watch? We were trying to shoot out our windshield and it's incredibly dirty. And we saw you doing this. And you come in here to get yours done. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would have thought you'd have something better to find than some some silly coach driver washing the windows. You haven't seen our show. <laughs> <laughs> well, can, maybe Mike can just borrow your, your, yeah. your, your, sque your squeezer. First lesson right off the bat. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> He's keeping a close eye on you, I noticed. How, how am I doing? Just excellent. <laughs> hey, that's my leg. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Hey, oh, what man. are you doing here? <laughs> TV weasels have no shame. But at least our windows are clean. Thank you very much. Very much. <laughs> now we can focus nice. on the matter at hand. The matter of Mooney. Ernest Mooney Warther, that is. Second grade graduate, Steel Miller, big time fan of Honest Abe, knife maker extraordinaire, and, whew, carver of the most amazing things one man has ever refused to sell. He learned from the history books when he was a kid how carvings had been found in the tombs of Egypt, thousands of years old, still in perfect shape, and what were they made out of? Ebony wood and ivory. So he knew from early on what he wanted to use, just couldn't afford that until he's in his 40s. Started off with walnut, a local hardwood he'd get for free from local farmers and sawmills. And when my grandmother made beef vegetable soup, he received the bone instead of the dog. And all the white trim on his very early trains was all carved from beef bones. That, that's quite a, a photo there. Yeah, he's quite a character looking there. Yes, in fact, I'm that age that he is right there in that picture. And that's why my wife makes me keep my hair short. He always said God gave him a choice hair or brains, and so he took hair. To him, the steam engine 
what is the greatest invention of all time. It sparked the Industrial Revolution. It helped build America to what it is today. And he loved mechanics. What had more mechanics than a steam engine? But when he was 28, he set a lifetime goal, and he was a goal setter supreme. And that goal was to carve the history of the steam engine. These carvings are mechanically accurate, down to every nut and bolt. Air hoses, the valves on those air hoses actually open and close. The bells swing, couplers work. Uh, your pistons are timed with driving arms and, and fly rods. Inspected by railroad engineers over the years, they cannot find anything missing or anything out of scale. This is actually one of his uh, last carvings. He finished this at the age of 80. It's all carved of ebony and ivory. And the amazing part of the carving is the funeral coach itself. The details of Lincoln lying in his coffin, tables, chairs, sinks, tea kettles. It's just amazing the accuracy that he was carving to when he was 80 years old. This is a carving of the steel mill that he worked in, and when he was older, he wanted to show people what he did when he was young. At the age of 67, carved this plant, all carved of ivory and walnut. This was just a nine-month project, which includes the mechanics. And he carved his buddies. Their good habits are bad. The chief engineer took a lot of cat naps. There's the boss waking him, pounding his fists. The pliers tree took a block of walnut that size and shape placed 31,000 cuts into it, and it opened to 511. And that's what you see here in the tower. He often referred to that carving as his most worthless. This was just pliers. To him, carving had a purpose, and that's why he next carved the history of the steam engine. I love this shot of the root. What's the significance of the root? That's a tree stump that was found out here in Amish country. He was trying to find a piece of wood large enough to carve this engine, finally found that right stump, dug the stump out, and a year later, that tree stump had turned into that carving. Is that movie the right stump? Yeah. <laughs> I'm very fortunate to be able to, to do what I'm doing today, to, to grow up with this. And when you're younger, you don't think anything of it. You just think that's normal for your granddad to be sitting in the shop carving these priceless trains, which you don't think they're priceless at that age. But as you get older, you certainly start appreciating. People wonder why this collection is not in the Smithsonian. The man behind the carvings would be lost. Here you can see how they lived, how they did this, and why. And that's what our displays are all about, the man behind it. Best make that man and woman, since Mooney's missus also left a barn full of buttons. A vast array that's been artfully arranged for your inspection. Plus, there's world-class knives still being made on the premises, a gift shop and gorgeous gardens. And before you know it, you're running late, which of course we are. After pondering the possibilities of our complimentary pliers, we hop back in the van to resume racking up more spine-numbing miles. And there we are, just about out of Ohio, when Mike says, did you see that? And Randy says, I think so, which is code for Don, get the camera and see why Rock City rocks on. But not this time. Seems that the guy who's made all this stuff would rather spend his time making it than telling us about it. So it will remain a mystery. Which means we're back in the van again, winding through a wee bit of West Virginia, then dipping into the Quaker State which reminds me of an urgent need to put the pee back in Pennsylvania. <laughs> and wouldn't you know, the first facilities we find would be right next to a striking likeness of Cannonsburg's favorite son. Repeat after me. Como, 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 like. Como, como, como like Perry. You know, I always thought he was bigger than this. And doesn't he have a really flat butt? Hey, young man, is Perry Como from here? Okay. He's young. The youth of America, that's what's wrong with the youth of America right there. He doesn't there. know, you see. Look, these kids know Perry Como. You kids know Perry Como, don't you? What? You know Perry Como, don't you? Yeah. My dad hooked the speakers. <laughs> His dad hooked the speaker up. Talk about your brush with greatness. What could we do but brush ourselves off and keep driving to Pittsburgh? 
or more accurately, all the way across it to Swissvale, where Carl Mullen, who's definitely not Swiss, is busy making music, art, and a fine cup of tea. I came for a week 20 years ago. I got lost, lost in America, lost in Pittsburgh. Did you start making these though as instruments or just as planks? I started painting them as planks and then I've always made homemade instruments. I made boxes. Besides the music that I play, um, I do music for, for, for any opportunity I get and I've made music for theater companies and dance companies. And I particularly like homemade instruments that have a kind of unique sound to them. I usually use the word painter and not artist, and because uh, I was a house painter as well, and uh, it's an honourable profession. But I like to paint a lot on found materials. These are obviously old bits of uh, tile, and uh, roofing slate that I particularly like because they're Pittsburgh, so they've got like 50 years of grime on them. I found this great piece over here. It's from a men's urinal. There's even some graffiti still on it, like "Meet me here later" or something like that. It says on it. <laughs> As a self-taught artist, I was drawn more to materials that I was familiar with. I'm familiar with a bit of wood or, or an old window, much more than I am by some, by a precious art object that you need years and years of training to work with or something. I paint with tea. It's a form of uh, watercolor painting. Besides the kings, as you probably noticed, I like doing animals. Um, it's nice to do a bunch of them and you let them dry, and uh, they dry very nicely. I'm running down the street, I got a suitcase in my hand. Get a full horizon, as fast as I can. I've not been to much school, I don't have a history of doing very well with school. I'm better off left to my own, inventing my own things, and I've tended to have done that since an early age, and so I kind of invent my own world, whether it's with music or with uh, art materials. The wax medium that I'm using actually is supposed to be heated up, apparently. I just put my hands in it and paint with my hands. This is uh, walnut oil, raw pigment, and uh, charcoal of this series. I like incorporating accidents because, to some extent, it's an accident that I'm even doing them but I put a bit of cardboard underneath and all of a sudden the ridges in the cardboard came out. I do lots of Irish beasts. And an Irish queen? An Irish queen. And the three wise men. Or the three musicians. I paint them on the floor and I mix everything with my hands. And again, lots of hand prints. I use both hands. It's, it's a physical, it's a very sweaty, energetic way to paint. I guess my work isn't really about theory about things. I don't have a theory. I really don't. And you don't have to. Not on good. our Okay, good, because I was worried. <laughs> <laughs> I can only do what I do. I don't sing songs by anybody else. I don't even, I don't even know a single song by anybody. So for me, it's important that, that, it's, that it's honest. And the best way for me to do that is that, that I stay within myself to some extent. I like that authentic experience, whether it's the playing the music, or me on the porch with a cup of tea in the morning, the neighbors asleep, making a picture. You know, it's it's got to be, uh, it's got to have that on, that that authentic feel to it. Okay, here's how a new day begins with Pittsburgh's clogged arteries and the boys trying to navigate them, or trying to decide where they need to be navigated. And the answer is Wilmerding, one of those factory towns for which this area is famous. And waiting for us there will be one Kathleen Ferry, formerly of Turtle Creek and formerly not an artist. Until at age 58, she took a painting class that changed her life. The senior citizens, they had this uh, craft class. Everyone did something different. So anyhow, we were just supposed to do a um, heritage theme. So my husband had the grocery store. And I thought, well, that store is my kid's heritage. So I did the store, and I thought, well, why don't I just do the whole town while it's still in my head? 
So I did the whole town. If you go through here, every store at that time was uh, the way I remember it in the 40s. And uh, someone said, how do you remember the town so well? I said, I don't remember names or phone numbers today, but I remember things like that. I didn't dream I would be doing this, but my husband happened to die the first year I started to paint. And when I couldn't sleep at night, I'd get up and I didn't feel like reading. And I thought, you know, I didn't like the way I did that sky. So I'd go back and, and you know, and do it again. Next thing you know, I'd hear the birds sing. I thought, oh, I thought it was three, but I didn't know it was six already. So that is really how I got started on this. And it's been so satisfying. A lot of people want to come in to see them. And I welcome people to come in to see them. It, it does my heart good to get a couple compliments once in a while, you know. So I've done every town around here. Pitcairn, Wilmerding, Turtle Creek, East Pittsburgh, um, North Braddock, Braddock, McKeesport, and a couple of Pittsburgh. There used to be a swimming pool in the park, and there was a uh, bandstand here, and I have soldiers and sailors in every picture, and that way you can tell how old I am. But over the hill is the steel mills and the Westinghouse and the bridges and the hills. Most of them are smoky and dark, and the one I have, a red sky, and a kid came in here and looked at him, how's come you have red in the sky? I said, because we, he said, you didn't have red skies. I said, yes, we did. And on the other hand, we had street lights on in the daytime because it was dirty. Pittsburgh had its reputation of being dirty and uh, you, the street lights would be on in the daytime. But it's not 100% accurate. It's just what, whatever comes into my head's what I use. <laughs> I d did things the way they used to be to begin with. But then I decided they're going to tear our town apart again, so I thought I better paint it the way it is now. And that's why it's these two pictures behind me here above the couch. That's how it is right now. This looks like a museum, doesn't it? <laughs> I do have people begging to buy these, and I don't want to sell them. You know what? They're like my babies. They take me so long to produce them. I don't do them in a half an hour like the guy on television. And when they take me four months or so to do it, well, it seems like I had a baby, and I just can't part with them. So. I might not leave a fortune to my kids, but I'll leave the pictures and I have people waiting to buy them. <laughs> Kathleen's paintings have made her something of a celebrity here. She even had her picture on the front page, but they misspelled her name, something I'm pretty sure we won't do. Then again, no other reporters would have done this. Oh, long time since I had one of those. <laughs> and thus begins another long stretch of Chrysler confinement. Miles and miles of turnpike driving, whizzing past exits for Johnstown and Altoona, but not for Bedford. Since once again, Randy proves he can't resist the lure of anything that has a coffee pot shape. Oh, well, there it is. There it is. Okay, it's a little worse for wear. So once this was a great landmark on the Lincoln Highway. You like the Lincoln Highway, don't you? Is this it? This is Lincoln Highway. People from the East Coast, it really was like the main road, wasn't it? It was the main road from New York to San Francisco. Really? Yeah. Do you know this? Yeah. That's, that's a major disrepair there. Yeah, and don't cut yourself on like that nail and get tetanus. You know, we'd have to take you to, to the Lincoln Hospital. Well, look at that spout, though. That spout's still in pretty good shape. That was a stout spout. Okay, it's the big coffee pot in Bedford. Mike, in honor of the Hershey folks who are just down the way. Yeah. In honor of the Hershey folks, I spilled that chocolate you dumped out of the bag in my. And there's more over here. <laughs> First one of the trip. <laughs> Let's just hope it's not the last. But at this point, all we can do is jump back in the van, drive through more rain, more tunnels behind vehicles that seem disturbingly confused and through more rain, which finally began to abate as we reached Charlottesville. Now on the outside, this appears to be just another moderately priced overnight accommodation, but this particular budget inn offers at no extra charge rooms with a theme. So naturally, this old coot was assigned to the Wild West Room. Blacksmith slinging in the dead of night. There's the bank. Probably some change in that sofa. Let's hope we don't go there. Uh, we should be on the next stage leaving town. One producer chose to bungle in the jungle. Huh. 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 Yeah, nothing like some wood paneled trees. Feel that? You feel the texture? I 
canopy of green above my bed. While producer number two eagerly embraced the animal kingdom in Noah's Ark. Oh, that's so romantic. Zebra rump. Oh, excuse me. Oh, oh, don't rock the boat, baby. Oh, oh, geez. Oh, you get the idea. It's a lodging adventure. But before it gets any more adventurous, I say lights out. Good night, campers. All right, here's the good news. Everyone's room was fine. Now for a warning. If bad backing offends you, look away now. It will likely take Randy as long to get out of the lot as it will to reach our next stop, which is just at the other end of this service road. And it is Roadside America. No, not the website from which we uh, borrow so often, but the granddaddy of all tiny towns ever made. Built as a hobby by a Redding man named Lawrence Geringer and operated to this day by his daughter, Alberta. <laughs> Whoa. See, more than you expect. There's no doubt about it. Wow. I'm, I'm astonished. I'm having depth perception problems here. Is it like two miles across this thing or what? It feels like it, doesn't it? Yeah. I think of my daddy so much. I wish he was living my mom and daddy, that they could see it still here. And you know what I liked when I sit there and have him open the door for the first time and see it. I get more wows <laughs> than you can believe. Look, look, I'm running the train. With your finger? I'm running the train. See, off, on, off, on, off, on. There he goes around the curve. Are you running that train? Stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. Ooh, oh, crossing, wait for the car. Oh. <laughs> when you come in, the houses are like in the 40s. And then as you go around, it goes back 200 years. So he had a plan on that? And he may, oh yeah, when he uh, had it in his mind. He had it in his mind, he'd talk about it, but nobody, uh, you know, understood. I think you're right. I think those are, uh, are pliers, a field of them. Field of pliers. And back there are some, some men harvesting big mushrooms. Yeah, you know, he did all this years ago. It's like frozen in time. It's like if you stood on one side of the country and could see all the way across. This is what you'd see. What'd you see first? That sign right there. Digging a new cesspool in the yard. Hey, I can dig it. If you take notice in the modern village, every siding is different. Chimneys are different. Roofing is different. And every house is completely different. Well, look, there's a man flying a surfboard. It's a lot of time consumed in there, but it was all as a hobby. You just never saw him out. There's the trolley. God, that's a one fast moving trolley. Look what's playing at the theater. Boys Town? Yeah. That's uh, chief no running at any time. Does anybody feel the need to go to the bathroom? Yeah, all this running water. People don't so. believe it until they, you must see it. I tell people all the time, you must see it to believe it. And like the sign says, you must see the spectacle of night falling over America, complete with Kate Smith singing up a storm, which we'd like to play, but then we'd have to pay for the rights, so use your imagination. But there's no guessing about the gift shop. It's stocked to the gills with goodies, which Alberta's handing out happily. As a TV weasel, I'm in heaven right now. You are. I got a mug. You know what? That shines in the dark. Prompting in turn okay. some quick show and tell of our own. Well, this is the world's largest ball of videotape. Oh my God, a videotape. Leaves them speechless every time. And speaking of time, there's just enough left to annoy that part of the viewing public that hates to see us play catch. Alberta's king with me. So out come the gloves, a ball, and what will have to pass for witty repartee. 
I saw way more than I expected. I learned things, I feel growth, and we got free stuff. Oh, oh don't hit the fork. Oh, forget so. Oh. Hey, no interfering with balls on, on play. <laughs> no leaning over, you get ejected. From the side of the road at Roadside America, this is Don the Camera Guy signing off. Oh! Did I have some mojo on it? I had some mojo. To learn more about the sites you've seen on this show and plan a road trip of your own, visit Rare Visions on the web at kcpt.org. You can also purchase DVDs, videotapes, and a companion book to this award-winning series. Call 1-800-459-9733. to our old let's stop and get off the highways. We used to be so good at this. You become your fathers. God. That works, that's good. That was painless, wasn't it? It was, as long as I didn't look at him.